Good morning. Happy Monday. Welcome to Instagram Live today where we have a dermatologist speaking, Dr. Leslie Clark Lozer, speaking about different kinds of skin cancer and how to discuss as it is National Cancer Survivor Month and discuss the different kinds of cancers that are faced on a daily basis. And all of us know that skin cancer is one of the most and highest common cancers. So good morning. Welcome. How are you? Hi. So good to How see your face. You too. How's everything? Okay. Having a good Monday? I am. I am going to awesome. apologize in advance. I'm doing this from home. And I hear my little puppies scratching at the door. So just keeping it real, there may be some <laughs> unintended uh, participant not. it's okay my dog too so if you guys okay. hear me hear him forgive him he might bark he likes to you know give me the warning if somebody's like near the door That's so, funny. so well thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning as we're so excited to have you on and share information about skin cancer you know how it can be prevented, what types of skin cancer, and what people can do, and maybe some signs that if you see mold changing, like what we can talk about to yes. educate our community. So if I'd like, if you'd like to go ahead and maybe just do a short introduction and then tell our, our visitors how they can follow you or maybe find the practice for those of you that are local. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. I get so excited to have the opportunity to talk about skin cancer and skin cancer prevention in a setting like this. Um, as a board certified dermatologist and seeing patients in our office setting, sometimes the conversation is so rushed um, and there's so much more that we'd like to share or answer questions. So thank you, because this is a great forum. So like you said, I'm down here in South Florida. I'm a South Florida dermatologist, um, treat skin cancer regularly and you know, there's so much data that you even provided some great data. And I think it's a phenomenal resource for um, anyone watching that's free, which is from the Skin Cancer Foundation. So most of the data that I will be sharing with you today and we'll be reviewing is from the Skin Cancer Foundation. And so that is something that is accessible to everybody. Perfect. You know, let's start off. How common is skin cancer? So common. Um, would you believe that really more individuals will be diagnosed with skin cancer in the United States this year than any other cancer combined? So that means it's exceedingly common. And we know that one in five of us is going to develop a skin cancer by the age of 70. Um, and moreover, people are dying, you know, a couple people, two people every hour will pass from skin cancer. But I think what the most encouraging thing for us to know is that it is treatable and especially when it's diagnosed early and it's also preventable. So to a certain extent, you know, some of us may, and we can cover this maybe even at a later date because we talk about genetics all the time. Um, and some of us may carry some genetic predisp predispositions that may set us up for increased risk, but you know, given as a whole, there's a lot we can be doing to decrease our risk for developing skin cancer. Great. And that's, you know, some of the things that we talk about are, you know, putting on SPF and which yeah. SPF is good for you. And, you know, how do you avoid the sun? Do you wear a hat? Do you just wear SPF? You know, what are we putting on our kids? You know, as our kids are exposed, obviously in South Florida, what, 24 hours a day, right? Like when they're outside. Yes. So like, what are different types of skin cancer? Yeah, I mean, you bring up all the important questions that I think most of us have. Um, I guess first I'll start with the most common types of skin cancer. And we think of three, basal cell carcinoma being probably the most common one, followed by squamous cell carcinoma, and then followed by melanoma. And fortunately, based on their prevalence, um, we also know that basal cell is the least dangerous, followed by squamous cell, and then followed by melanoma. So, you know, basal cell, we're going to see a lot of them, but the majority are treated either by just removing them in the office, same with squamous cell, and or using topical prescription creams. So they are very treatable. Um, followed by melanoma, 
melanoma, also very treatable. It's found early on in their studies that show if you find a, a melanoma and you treat it within 30 days, you really increase survival. And on top of that, the thin melanomas have a 99% five-year survival rate. So they are very treatable, survivable, um, and often curable, but early detection is key. Um, and so how do you prevent, and you were talking about sunscreen, and I think, you know, there's, there's no lack of press on sunscreen. Sunscreen is always going to be something that we talk about. And living in South Florida, so important, not only for ourselves, but for our children. So we'll start with kids. Um, you know, sun exposure, UV exposure, and the damage from it is cumulative. So the earlier we start with UV protection, whether it be like you mentioned, a hat, sunglass, sunglasses, or eyes are at risk for cataracts that can develop prematurely if we don't protect them. Um, but hats and UV protective clothing and shade remain the most effective. So we'll take that and we'll say, okay, so blocking it completely is the most effective. Then we go to sunscreen. So what kind of sunscreen should I use? And if you look at the Skin Cancer Foundation, data, it will say 15 or higher. Scratch that and we go to 30 or higher. Um, why wow. is that? Because the way we've tested sunscreens in the past, which is using a certain amount per square centimeter area, um, is rarely actually how we apply it in real life. So in essence, we don't really apply enough sunscreen to get that, you, you know, that, that SPF of a 30. So or at 15 for that matter. Now 30 is really the minimum recommendation. So then the question is, do I do a 30 or do I go even higher than that? The reality is that if you go higher, you probably are getting more of that protection of a 30 just based on the fact that that's how we tend to apply our sunscreen. Um, we want to apply at least a shot glass amount <laughs> to a region, face, arms, legs. So that's a whole lot of sunscreen. Um, reapplying is critical. Um, all thanks to the FDA, they have made all of the sunscreen uh, monographs of what you see on the back consistent. So it makes it easier for all of us to know what it is we're getting. So it should look the same. And on the front, it will list whether or not it's water resistant. It would either have nothing or it will say water resistant 40 minutes, water resistant 80 minutes. And I think we all have to decide for ourselves what our level of activity is gonna be. So if you're at the beach or the pool and you're going in and out or playing a sport that you're really sweaty, I mean, go with the you, you know, water resistant 80 minutes and reapply. You know, The rule of thumb is reapply every two hours, but if you're in and out of the water and sweating tremendously, try and reapply closer to you know, an hour um, you know, as your interval, your frequency. And then ingredients, that's always a big topic. So I think with regard to ingredients, you want at a minimum broad spectrum. What does broad spectrum even mean? That means that you're getting both the UVA and the UVA, UVB part of the spectrum. So that makes it broad. We want to encompass the majority of the harmful rays. And Personally, I'm a big fan, although if you look at consumer reports, they don't seem to perform as well, but I can promise you there's data to suggest they do. I like the physical sunscreen. So I'm a big user of zinc and titanium sunscreens, and that does cover a large range of that, that spectrum. And I usually will use 4% as my lower limit cutoff for zinc. So you really want to see that something has zinc at least 4%. And then you add titanium, and that brings you out further on that UVA spectrum. And one of the reasons I like them is twofold. One, which is very important to your group in particular, is the question of the role of endocrine disruptors. And if we have these endocrine disruptors that we're really beginning to understand and what role they could potentially have, um, in estrogen or hormone sensitive situations or disease states, well, let's avoid them until we have a better sense if it's possible. So that's number one. Number two, physical sunscreens are just that, they're physical. You put them on the skin surface and then they're active. So if you're like me and you're always kind of moving around and not planning well, I don't have 20 to 30 minutes to wait for it to absorb then for me to go outside and say, oh yeah, I'm getting my sun protection. 
So I think the zinc and titanium for a lot of us and for our kids is, you know, it's immediately effective. So that's the sunscreen thing. Wow. You know, what are some causes of skin cancer? Yeah. Well, the number one is UV, ultraviolet, um, from the sun. The majority of skin cancers that are not genetically mediated um, are really from UV exposure and it's cumulative, right? So what does UV do? It damages the DNA in our skin and our cells um, and enough DNA hits will result in unregulated cell production like it does for anything else um, in our bodies and cancers and it's no different for skin. So that unregulation happens as a result of UV damage. And so UV, number one, tanning beds, artificial huge, huge, huge. Um, and those of us that were dumb enough to sit in a UV bed to get a base tan when she was in college, <laughs> I myself all the time, we are at increased risk. So what do we do? We change our behaviors because we know changing the behavior has value. Um, right. I've had a lot of individuals will say to me, but wasn't all the damage done by the time I was 18? The answer is no. We used to say that we were wrong. A lot was done. We did change a bit of our trajectory based on what we did, but we can course correct a bit if we change our behaviors, hands down. So, you know, it's, it's never too late. It's just, you know, if you know that you've had those exposures and, you know, other things like five sunburns or even just one blistering sunburn kind of increases, unfortunately, our risk for melanoma. See a dermatologist regularly. Take some of the burden off of yourself and do your, you know, your annual skin checks if you know that your past behavior does put you more at risk. You know, you talk about annual checks, right? Yeah. Like, you know, people are like, well, I don't have to see a dermatologist. I'm like, of course you should once a year. Am I right? Like, what age does that start? How does that apply, like, in the dermatology world? Yeah. So it ba based on family history. So if there's a strong family history, chances are genetically you have some predisposition. So if you are somebody who's been out in the sun a lot and there is a family history or either way without the sun history, but just the family history, you know, we really want to establish a relationship, I would say, at 30 or early 30s with a dermatologist. The only caveat to that would be is individuals that we have that have dysplastic or atypical moles. And if you have a lot of atypical or dysplastic moles, we call them nevi, um, we know that the more you have, the more your chance is of developing melanoma. Um, and I don't want to scare people, but I also just want you to be aware. It does put you in a category where establishing that earlier relationship only serves to benefit you. As uncommon as these skin cancers are at younger ages, they do present, and oftentimes in the younger population, they're diagnosed later because they're not under the care of a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. And w why not just establish that relationship? And the thing to look for you know, they always say with atypical mold, I have to make sure that my mold isn't changing and becoming a melanoma, which I think is a great, you know, question that most ask. But we know that actually 80%, roughly 80% of melanomas arise, we call it de novo, not from an existing or changing mold. It was actually just born to be a melanoma. And so what I tell my patients is always be aware of things changing because you never know when it started and if it was born to be a melanoma. Right. However, always heed the ugly duckling sign, right? Because it can be overwhelming to try and remember what every single thing on your body looked like. But if your you know, attention is being drawn to something, can't quite put your finger on it, or you're like, it just doesn't look like anything I've made before, right. or maybe it's become symptomatic, it's painful, itchy, or it's bled, and I'm not provoking it, come show your dermatologist, because you'd rather always be on the end of the conversation where, oh, I'm so glad that you came in, it's a nothing, than having to go in the other direction. Right. You know, one of the ladies are asking, if you have thinner hair, how do you protect your scalp from getting sunburned? 
It's such a good question. And so many of us, believe it or not, do have thinning hair that becomes an issue for increased sun exposure in our 20s or 30s. And it really picks up in our 30s where then now we've had 10 to 15 years of unintended increased sun exposure to our scalp. And we diagnose basal cells and squamous cells in the scalp, unfortunately. So make sure your derm is always looking in your scalp. It takes us a few seconds, but you'd be surprised sometimes what you can find. So what do you do? A hat, number one, is gonna be the best option. But you're not gonna walk mm -hmm. around wearing a hat every day. So there are spray sunscreens and powder sunscreens. And the powder sunscreens are, are really nice. They're physical sunscreens, usually zinc and titanium based. And you can use that to kind of place it into your part. Some of the liquid and gel sunscreens aren't gonna mess up your hair. I personally would look like someone poured Crisco on my head if I had to do that. So it, it's not, you know, cosmetically acceptable, if you will. But the powders really do blend. So you want to be mindful. I think it's a phenomenal question because it's it's a real concern, an important issue. So you're saying use, what it, can you go over that one more time? Yeah, so, so it's it, a powder sunscreen. Powder sunscreens, okay. there's a few brands out there. We, there's Isden, which is a company from Spain. SkinCeuticals also has a powder sunscreen. Um, the spray sunscreens you can find from pretty much any um, manufacturer, but there's, there's no shortage, but the powder might be the way to go. Um, they're easy to keep with you in your purse so that it, you know, it's been several hours and you feel like you want to reapply. Um, it's not as much of a production to have to do it. You just kind of look in the mirror and, and get it into your part. Interesting. I'm definitely going to invest in that for my daughter. It's <laughs> over the counter. Oh yeah. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but my daughters when we've gone on a vacation and they decided they wanted to have their hair braided well lo uh -huh. and behold at the end of that day guess who had a sunburn in her scalp and then yeah. you know as a mom you're kicking yourself thinking right. how did i how did i forget to do that so i think just having it you know top of mind or front of mind is important well it's interesting because my daughter can be outside for like an hour like even playing softball and i'm not joking you like her scalp is beet red and i'm always like what can oh, we do like and she's like don't don't put you know spray in my hair and i'm like yes. it's okay she's like no i can't and i'm like well now i have an answer yes yes no you're you're right absolutely right you know when we talk about risks you know who's at risk besides like family history and living in south florida like are there other risk factors that play a role besides like our genetics you know just maybe because you're pale or you know you're in the sun like what other risk factors play a role in skin skin cancer as the numbers are so high right like what can we do to educate the community on how we can avoid those risks I think knowing that everybody is potentially at risk and it does vary according to the darkness of your skin. So in the dermatology world, we don't talk in terms of color of skin. We talk in terms of really shades because that's what we are, right? We all have, believe it or not, the lightest of skin types versus the darkest, the same number mm -hmm. of melanocytes in our skin. It's just how much melanin and pigment they produce and then deposit to act as a sunscreen, if you will, or protection to our skin. So we talk in terms of Fitzpatrick one through six, one being the lightest, fair, fair, fair. You think of a very pale, maybe a redhead with freckles and then the darkest of skin types. But guess what? All of us are at risk. So your risk for basal cell and squamous cell are going to be highest and even melanoma in the lightest of skin um, types and Fitzpatrick's ones and twos. But then you move into the fact that, you know, you have mixed ethnicity. So you can have a family, you know, you can have somebody who is a Fitzpatrick three or four and has a parent, one parent is a six and the other is a one. Well, guess what? They inherit both traits and genetics. Everybody is at risk. But darkest of skin types too, we know that there's a high or risk in that population if you're gonna they're gonna develop a skin cancer for it to be what we call an acral skin cancer or melanoma so in black dark-skinned individuals have to be mindful if there's something that doesn't look right on your palm or your soul inside the mucous membranes don't ignore it because these are things that can present themselves and the famous kind of um, example that's presented is that Bob Marley did in fact pass away from a melanoma on his foot. 
And so these are things that are real. And for using him as an example, as sad as and tragic as it is, um, I think it's helpful and relatable. Be like, oh my God, if it can happen to him, it can happen. I diagnose non-melanoma skin cancers um, on Latin individuals often, um, basal and squamous being the most common type. But everybody is at risk and everybody can benefit from UV protection. You know, sharing Bob Marley's story, I have to say it's like an inspiration, right? Because when we talk about different ethnicities, the same thing with African-American Black women with breast cancer, right? They're at a 40% higher risk. And some of them don't see, you know, their mortality rates so much higher, but are always like, well, no, I don't want to get tested. But then you hear stories of Bob Marley and yeah. his background, and you're like, it, like you said, it can happen to anyone. So that's why it's so important to raise awareness, yes. especially on skin cancer, knowing the stats and, you know, what we can do to make a difference. Because believe it or not, like nobody wants to add another physician to their life. But going and just getting a check really takes 10 minutes from head to toe. Yeah. I mean, maybe longer. I mean, but just take that time and make sure you're taking care of your skin because it's something you need forever. And I'll never forget, like, my grandmother had a cancerous piece on her nose, and she had to keep going back and keep going back. And every time, you know, they thought it was gone, but just that follow-up and consistency to make sure that you don't have that cancer within your body, I think is so yes. imperative, especially when you deal with this, you know, and you see the stats. And, you know, sometimes they take stats to know what's next. Or, like, the reason I did the Skin Cancer Foundation was because it had real data. and. Yeah you know, providing things in real life, I think really helps our community understand like the dangerous and the risks of how things can be caught early. Because, you know, who knows? And, you know, this is our next question it leads into is how skin cancer treated? You know, is it treated like um, a breast or ovarian? Is it treated with chemo? Is it, you know, mm -hmm. how do you guys treat skin cancers? I think you touched on a few really important things when you were just sharing, because, you know, it is treatable, number one, right? Treatable, but even before that, preventable. We already went over that part. Um, and often curable on top of it. So, you know, you have treatable and then you have treatable curable. Um, so the majority of skin cancers will be treated as an outpatient in-office procedure where it's much like the procedure, just a little bit more involved of the actual biopsy where the area is numbed up and then the area is removed and you get some stitches. Um, another way that we treat in the office is with something called electrodesiccation and curatage, which the area is again numbed up and then we just kind of scrape and burn the area and you have a little wound that heals up in a couple of weeks. Those are the two most common. There are a subset of very thin, superficial, in situ, which we hear in other um, cancer descriptions, superficial ones that are amenable to treatment with creams. Great, right? That's phenomenal. So then the patient uses a cream for average six weeks and the area gets very irritated, inflamed, sometimes painful, but often scars without, um, sorry, heals without scarring. Another way sometimes like with what your, your grandmother had done, which was Mohs, it sounds like. They had mm -hmm. to keep going back. So Mohs is a great procedure that is utilized to treat um, in a tissue sparing site type of way. So on a nose, you don't have a lot of skin like you do on the back where you can take out a big chunk. So in Mohs, they will take a little piece, the least amount possible, and you sit and wait while the doctor will go and look under the microscope mm -hmm. and say, did we get it? If they didn't, they've marked exactly where that other part is. So then they'll take another little piece, but not a huge piece. So it allows you two things, to take as little as possible, making sure that the entire cancer is removed and you leave that day knowing the entire cancer is removed. So that's Mohs. And then there's radiation. Radiation, but not like we think of in breast cancer where it's a little bit more um, in bulk and marking has to happen, but it is targeted and it's a focused electron beam and they do it in the office and patients will do it. Um, <laughs> you're good on my end, I think. Okay. Um, so yeah, don't worry. So um, there's radiation and then in really advanced situations, um, you will have chemotherapy that will be involved. Uh, in chemotherapy, if it is a more advanced melanoma, 
squamous cell or basal cell has been um, utilized. Perfect. Well, you know, we have another question. Are there any reliable recommended products or things that help treat sunburns to decrease the severity of the skin changes or the damage from the sunburn already done? Great question. I love that question. And, that, and, and the answer is yes, there are. Um, but, you know, how much they're helping, we don't necessarily know entirely. So there are a line of DNA repair enzymes that are being included as after sun exposure lotions. Also in that brand I mentioned, ISDIN, um, they have incorporated into their sunscreen some DNA repair enzymes. So those are designed to, as the UV damage is happening, to help to repair some of that DNA damage. Um, and then there are other things that you can do if you find yourself in a, you know, kerfuffle with the sun that you can take almost immediately after an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen. Um, you can utilize things like lactic acid if there's a burn to calm as an anti-inflammatory your skin. So that can be as simple as whole milk with some ice cubes and use a compress. And look, I, basically you have to use whole milk because that's gonna have the most amount of lactic acid to calm the skin. And you sometimes in certain situations, um, steroids will be prescribed. Hopefully that is not the case. Uh, so those are things that you can do to help mitigate some of the UV damage. Oh, I see that question. ISDIN, it's I-S-D-I-N, ISDIN. It's a company out of Spain and it's primarily a physical sunscreen. I believe it's 10% zinc sunscreen. So um, in all uh, honesty, it's missing in my mind a little bit of the titanium. So a little part of the spectrum, but you can layer your sunscreens. There's nothing wrong with that. But I can tell you that it has a nozzle on it, the ISDIN one that allows you to get it into the hairline. So the last time my daughter got her hair braided, I just took it and I went right there and no sunburn. So it has, <laughs> it was helpful. No, that's helpful. Yeah. So, you know, as we're closing out, we first want to thank you so much for your time and dedication to coming on and educating the community. You know, what are two pieces of advice that you'd like to leave the community with as we end the month of National Cancer Survivor Month. And we know there's definitely, you know, survivors out there of skin cancer, but for the women and the, even the men that are listening, you know, what are two pieces of advice that you would personally like to share with our community? I think the most important, and I'm pretty sure you will second this knowing who you are, but you are always your own best advocate for everything. So, Number one would be you're always your own best advocate. If there's something that's not sitting right with you, whether it was in an experience with a healthcare professional, you didn't feel comfortable and you're like, I think I need another you know, opinion. Or the fact that there's something on yourself that's not sitting right and you think you should have it checked out. Well, trust yourself, trust your gut. Nobody's gonna advocate for yourself more than you are. So number that's number one. Um, and number two is just remember that skin cancer is preventable um, and treatable. And it all really um, is carried on the fact that you need to establish that relationship with somebody, a skin care, you know, a skin um, professional, a dermatologist to really look at your skin and you don't have to carry the burden of remembering again, what everything looks like on your body but if there's something that's changing, please don't be shy about it. Come to us and show us. Be your own advocate was a great way to end this. And I'd like to say thank you again for everybody that's tuned in, but make sure that you tune in because being your own advocate, um, melanoma is included in our genetic mutations for those of us who are BRCA positive or carry a different genetic mutation. So we will have you back on as we spoke about to talk about what's involved in a genetic mutation in skin cancer because it's not often spoken about, but we need to know our risks and we're super thankful for you coming on again, and it was great seeing you. And don't forget to follow 
Precision RX. And if you have not seen our post, just click on it and you can follow them for more information. They absolutely have a beautiful office right here in our backyard. So thank you again yes. so much. It was great seeing you. So great to see you. And yes, come visit us at Precision Skin Institute. If you ever have questions, again, your Skin Cancer Foundation reference, phenomenal. And I'd love seeing you as well. Perfect. Take care. Bye. Bye.